and welcome to class number 12 in Effective Meeting Management, Speech Communication 4397. In our last class, we were talking about elements of public speaking, things to take into account when you're preparing a speech. And I'd said that we would look at some different approaches, and then we ran out of time and didn't get to that, some approaches of how you might adapt the same material to different audiences. Uh, Typically, in public speaking textbooks, we think of audiences as being either hostile or sympathetic, or hostile or friendly, and we at least start with that basic uh, kind of generalization. You know, is this an audience that likes me on the front end, and if so, how will I adapt what I'm saying to that? Or do you go in expecting trouble, expecting hecklers, expecting hostile responses? Hopefully none of you find yourselves in positions where people are going to throw tomatoes or eggs or, or whatever, but you know, political candidates may find themselves in that arena. Uh, in between those two extremes, or over on the negative side, but not quite as bad as being at the point of throwing things at you, are situations that you get in where you have hecklers, uh, people who smart off and make hostile remarks and uh, are cutting and trying to catch you off guard and so forth. But assuming that you have a friendly audience, these people have invited you there, they're pleased that you're there, uh, how else might you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to put yourselves in a group in just a minute and you folks at home be thinking about this while they're working on it, what are some ways that you could classify audiences? You know, do, do the people, do you think that you all have the same kind of mindset or what kind of, of things go on in your head that if there were 50 people like Waleed or 200 people like Rahad or, uh, you know, 400 of a different set, what, what kind of people might you have? Is the question clear? Yes or no? Somewhat. Somewhat. Good. Okay. Well, that's clear enough. Okay, well, if you uh, put yourselves on a timer and folks at home work on this for a few minutes, and I want the people in the studio, to, you may want to pop across the other side here. You don't have to hold your microphones down for this. I just want you to huddle while we take a little time out here and uh, work on this and see what you come up with.
I'll tell you all about it, a stuck spot. Okay, just stay there because you're going to need to huddle again. Okay. All right. Uh, let's find out what our studio group came up with. Did you get a spokesperson? The person with the pen in the hand is elected. No. Okay. <laughs> we came up with uh, several, several different uh, demographic factors such as economics, career, trade, culture, political. I didn't get them all down if somebody else has them written down. Age and sex. Political beliefs. Uh, and employment status. Um, different ways of thinking as far as uh, analytical and closed-mindedness and open-mindedness. Okay. Um, I guess the you know political views would pretty much con uh, cover conservative or liberal uh, points of view. Anything else? Okay. Well, that's was that it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. For how'd you folks at home do? Oh, for such a brief period of time, you got lots of demographic factors down. That's good. Uh, I was glad to hear you mention the, I think it was rational versus closed-minded, which taps in more to the kind of thought processes that may be going on. From um, the July 1994 issue of Convene, I've pulled a little short article uh, that a fellow named Ronald Gross uh, submitted under the adult learning section and he's the person who often goes around and makes keynote speeches to different groups and uh, let's put this here and zoom in on. he uh, borrowed and I'm not sure where he found it a little tool called the Herman brain dominance instrument Yeah, there we go, that looks good. Okay, and he said, and, and this brain dominance instrument is just one way of thinking about audiences. And certainly all the things that you have just described uh, are appropriate and are, thing, are factors that you would take into account. Uh, but to the extent that this is accurate, and I want you to think about this a little bit too, uh, but anyway, Quadrant A says that some people, you know, if you were to give them these questionnaires, uh, some of the folks would be classified as rational, and he calls this the rational self. Uh, these are the people that focus on facts, they're very logical, they're very analytical. Uh, B is the safekeeping self that organizes and plans. C is the feeling self, which is very expressive and emotional. And D is the experimental self, which is imaginative and playful. And these are on the next visual that we're going to look at. Okay. Um, you might well find that people are a blend of some of these. You know, if you start to classify yourself, you may see that you're more of one at one time and, and less of another, and at another time you're more of something else and less of another. But if, if you were to classify yourself, and I won't ask you to do that here, but just ask yourself, you know, are you mostly rational? Would you fall into the logical analytical category? Are you a person who's very organized, who plans ahead? Uh, they put the label safekeeping self on that. I never thought of that as a safekeeping activity, but I guess it is. Uh, and I'm one of those people that you know, keeps a very meticulous calendar, and, and I guess that's a way of staying safe. The feeling self, the expressive emotional, and the experimental self, imaginative and playful. And you might find those different factors cutting across different elements, uh, no matter what the demographic factors of your audience are. You know, whether you have high income or low income people, uh, they could be rational or expressive or safekeeping or whatever, uh, whatever the ethnic group. So this is just a different way of looking at an audience. But according to uh, Mr. Gross, it's a useful approach for 
assessing the kind of public speaking activity, or that's not quite the word you're right, of assessing the way that you might present the materials that you're going to present to an audience. But first of all, I'm going to very shortly put you in groups again. Uh, I want you to think about how you would classify these four groups. Okay, I didn't type up a visual on those. You can just make a note. Okay, the first group is the Group Health Association of America, or HMOs. If, if you were going to, what I'm going to ask you to do is classify these groups according to this classification we just talked about. So the Group Health Association of America, i.e. HMOs, uh, New York State Nurses Association, probably any nurses association for that matter, but he was working with New York State. Uh, third, the American Society of Military Controllers, American Society of Military Controllers. You folks at home, write this down too, because you get to play the game. You can stop your VCR in a minute. Okay, in group four, the Direct Marketing Association of America. Direct Marketing Association of America. So you've got four groups here. Group Health Association, Nurses Association, Military Controllers, and Direct Marketing Association. Okay, we're going to take a time out here again for four or five minutes and let our studio group come up with a result. You folks at home, pause your VCR and uh, see how you would classify them, and then we'll compare that to what our keynote speaker did. Okay, group, you're on. The experimental self is imaginative and playful.
Oh, okay. Move you up here just so you're closer together and I'll have you hold. Okay, group, what did you come up with here? Knowing exactly what any of these organizations do, uh -huh. what, what their purpose is, we really had a guess, and uh, we came to only one consensus that we could agree on, and that is that we basically agree on everything. Uh, all four of the organizations we felt had at least two possible selves that could tend with. Want to start? The one with... Uh, Number one, Group Health Association of America, or the HMOs, I came up with self or safekeeping. Mm -hmm. So just because I figured they would be more into organizing and planning. Um, I know the other guys came up with uh, rational self, pardon the paper. Um, okay. I thought it was rational basically because you always hear about the statistics um, what the death rate is and um, how many drugs are out there and basically just statistics. So I felt it was rational. Okay. The second one, uh, New York State Nurses Association, I again thought that that would be more, more or less an organizing and planning. Maybe that's because I organize and plan a lot more. Um, uh, what would you come up with? For, uh, for the nurses. For the nurses, I got uh, feeling self, um, and I didn't put another choice on that. But I also think that all of these groups, um, to a certain certain extent, deal with uh, facts and and uh, logic. So uh, I would have to say A and C for uh, uh, feeling self and rational self for the for the nurses. Okay. Okay, and for the American Society of Military Controllers, I came up with, well, I think we all did, rational self, and it could also be safekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, for the simple fact, rational, I, just, I figured that could dealt with the military, again, not knowing exactly what that group does. And the military is very stringent and very strict, so I assume they're very meticulous about organizing and planning. Your pets love to organize. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do with the marketing association? Th that was the only one that we really all agreed on. Uh, our first choice um, immediately was uh, experimental self. Okay, good. And then, uh, but then after thinking a while about it, um, I later added rational self also because um, I'm assuming that this group would uh, be doing a lot of market research and um, using all kinds of census information and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So. A again. Okay. We well, did very well, if we assume the author's right. <laughs> uh, he classified them uh, just one quadrant each. Now, part of this is for the point of making the point for the article and uh, so forth. But he put uh, the Health Association in quadrant B, safekeeping, which was one of your choices there. Uh, group Health Association, safekeeping, quadrant B. The New York State Nurses Association, he put in quadrant C for the feeling self. The military controllers, rational, quadrant A. And direct marketing, quadrant D, experimental. Okay. And as we said before, truth probably is that there's some blends in there, and certainly within the audience there would be blends. Okay, now we went through this. Uh, one, to give you a feel for how those different mindsets work, and, and it probably works better going through the process than just labeling them and kind of flipping Cohen's. Did you feel yourself getting within the framework of the audience, trying to think like they might be thinking? And sometimes you have a lot of information about your audience, and other times you don't. About all you know is that this is the future Farmers of America, or this is the Rodeo Association, or this is the National Panhellenic Council, or this is the Astrology Society of Houston, and you don't have a lot more information about that until you start interviewing people and finding out. Okay, well, I want to read to you four or five paragraphs here, 
to show you what this fellow did, and apparently it was well received uh, from all four of these organizations, um, enough so you know, that they published the article in a national magazine and they didn't throw anything at him and so forth. Uh, but I was impressed with, even though I, as a speech communication professor, I might not do some of these things because of my own inhibitions and limitations, or again, I might, you know, depends on the mood I'm in. But anyway, here are some of the things that he did. Okay, so for the military controllers, which you put in quadrant A, the rational section, my presentation was direct, linear, factual, logical, analytic. I told them what I was going to tell them, I told them, and then I told them what I told them. You know, but very straightforward, uh, cut and dried. Lots of objective data, uh, whatever he considers to be a rigorous approach. Uh, that's what he used, a rigorous approach to enhancing their performance um, and so on. Okay, by contrast, my keynote address for the direct marketers could not have been more different. This audience thrived on using their imagination in colorful and dramatic ways. I presented the message as the magic of direct marketing. Dazzling stage magic, including a levitation and juggling with flaming torches. I can't pull that one off, but you know, maybe you hire the local special effects people uh, to come in and do this. Uh, in fact, that's what he did. A, a professional magician came in juggling flaming torches and so forth. Working as a team, we dramatized how they could use the principles of peak performance to break out of the box, catch the fire, and do what they dream. Okay, very different and innovative. Okay, for the New York State Nurses Association, uh, who gave high priority to empathy, caring, and interpersonal skills, I spoke personally about what their work had meant to my life, including true stories of my mother, daughter, and a close friend. My slides included moving photos of their members in action to reinforce my message and the techniques that I was teaching. So he took slides of nurses in action, related it to personal incidents, um, instances in his own life. Okay, the Group Health Association, <laughs> want to venture any guesses what he did this time? Well, okay, probably couldn't guess this one anyway. Okay, Group Health Association sought a presentation that would express the need to question existing practices in the light of the values and vision underlying the field. We sought a dramatic presentation that would remind the attendees of the great tradition in which they worked. As a result, their banquet speaker turned out to be the greatest questioner of all times. Any idea? Who? Ralph oh, no, no, older than Ralph Nader. Socrates himself, accompanied by his personal physician, Hippocrates played with suitable enthusiasm by an association member with thespian tendencies. So here they come in costume, Socrates and Hippocrates, and they're asking questions and dialoguing you know, about the philosophy of medicine and so forth. So together we gave attendees a memorable experience in asking questions, clarifying values, and cultivating their vision. Each of these four presentations fit the cognitive style, it doesn't have anything to do with demographics, fit the cognitive style of the audience as a whole. The magic show would not have worked for the controllers. Socrates would have bombed with the direct male marketers. The nurses would have tuned out the analytical method. And so he poses the question, you know, what's the cognitive style of your association group? and how can you address it more effectively at your next convention. So even though we've done some rules for how to make speeches, the purposes of introductions and conclusions and supporting material, the, you know, that's kind of the grunge stuff of getting it put together. Don't be limited by that. Know that uh, role playing, uh, you know, creative, things, dramatic things, that, that there are other possibilities uh, that you have there to hold the attention of the audience. Okay, we're going to shift a little bit 
Uh, as you know, in our next class, Dr. Robin Williamson, the chairman of the speech communication department at the University of St. Thomas, will be here. I'll be out of town, and uh, Ginger, our television assistant, will be getting class started and closed out and so forth. But I want to do a little bit of overview on group discussion today, uh, some things that I think Dr. Williamson probably won't cover. And then we're going to put you in a little fun group in a, in a little while that requires uh, no advanced preparation on your part, just to give you a feel for how roles emerge in groups. Okay, so, and Dr. Williamson will be talking to you about the philosophy of groups more, group dynamics and decision making. But some general things <clears throat> that affect group success. Most people like to be, number one, when you're visual, in groups that are informal and enjoyable, and if they have disagreements, they're friendly disagreements. You know, it's okay to say to somebody, hold on, you know, I can't buy that, or what, what, what makes you think that, you know, give me some reasons for that. But it's the difference between saying it in a nasty, hostile way uh, versus doing it in a lighter, friendlier kind of way. Okay, groups are usually more effective when they have balanced participation, when no one dominates. Even if you have a group member who knows, really does know more than anybody else, it's still preferable as far as the group is concerned to uh, have balanced participation and let people have their say and so on. Okay, third, a sense of accomplishment. Okay, a sense of accomplishment. People don't like to be in groups that waste their time. You, know, you, like I, may have quit some groups along the way because they were a waste of time. They sat there and they couldn't get, we'll talk in another week or so about uh, preparing agendas and you know, getting your order of business together those kinds of things. But we don't like groups that waste our time and if we don't feel like there's something productive coming out of the process, then uh, we're likely to do something else. Okay, fourth, a spirit of cooperation. You know, we don't like cranky people in groups. I mean, sometimes we may all choose to ventilate just a little bit, but um, you know, you don't, you don't want somebody who's being cranky and uncooperative and, and blocking. Dr. Williamson will talk with you more next time about specific personality types that we find in groups and some of the things that people do that are uncooperative. Okay, fifth, it's, a, it's usually a successful group when the members are stimulated to contribute thoughts and perceptions. If there's something about the way the leader asks the questions, and again, next time you'll get more into leadership, what constitutes effective leadership, uh, but one of the things the leader may do is ask questions that gets the group thinking. If the leader doesn't do that, other people in the group may do that. Number six, members show genuine interest in the meeting, the problem, the sharing of ideas, and the extent of cooperation. Okay, you like for people to look interested, look like they're pleased to be there, not just, you know, droopy, draggy, look like they're ready to fall asleep, not paying attention, sitting there doing something else. Okay, and then number seven, when there are criticisms, the criticisms are objective, descriptive, and collective, not personalized. And again, with Dr. Williamson, you'll get into some things like hidden agendas and group think and um, some of the problems, effective things that groups do as well as some of the problems that occur within groups. But it's one thing to say, you know, kind of referring to the group as a whole, uh, we're having trouble uh, staying on track here, or can we get back on the task? You know, we've, we've had a real good time discussing our summer vacations, but can we get back on task? 
rather than turning to someone in the group and saying, could you just shut up about what you did last summer? You know, we got business to take care of here. You know, that becomes personalized, individualized. And when there's a problem, it's the group's problem. Okay? So those are some of the things that contribute uh, to success. Let's go through six other little guidelines for working in groups, and then um, I'll put you in a group and we'll see what happens. Okay, one of the things you want to do when you're working in a group is listen to understand rather than to evaluate or refute. Listen for understanding. It doesn't mean that, that you'll never refute something or that you'll never respond to an argument, but instead of going in with a hostile attitude on the front end, you know, keep an open mind and, and be listening to understand the other person's point of view. Okay, you want to be persuasive. Certainly you're entitled to uh, support your own position to represent what you believe. But be, pers be persuasive, but avoid argument for its own sake. There's some people that are just rather contentious, and they argue just to be arguing. Okay, and if, if that's your personality, you probably need to join a debate squad because they sit around and argue to be arguing. And it's great mental exercise, you know, and they have a lot of fun with it, and they even I listen to them sometimes on campus shouting at each other. Um, but they've chosen to go into that context and argue for the sake of argument because they're clarifying ideas and, and being analytical. But in most groups, uh, that's not a desirable option. Okay, we're wanting um, persuasive reasoning, but not contentiousness, which has a more hostile air about it. Okay, third, view differences of opinion as opportunities rather than obstacles. You know, if you see a difference of opinion as a way to, uh, as an opportunity to be creative, to work on seeking a, a plan of compromise as a challenge rather than uh, a crisis or an obstacle. It just works better. It's, it's a mindset that will be more effective. Okay, fourth, and this overlaps a little with what we said before, but you want to encourage broad participation and protect the minority points of view. So uh, we'll get into the lines on that a little bit more as we get into the unit on parliamentary procedure. But everybody should have the right to be heard. Not that you have to listen to them forever, but you don't want to steamroll right over uh, less popular points of view. Okay, number five, assume responsibility for accurate communication. And that's something that everybody in the group should do. You know, you, whatever information you bring into a group, now what we're, the little role playing we're going to do in a minute, you can make up some stuff because we're kind of playing a game here. But when this is a serious group with a serious uh, situation to resolve, then you have a responsibility to bring accurate information that doesn't confuse the group. And then finally, summarize the progress periodically. Okay, summarize the progress periodically. And this may mean that uh, you may need a recorder in the group. You know, if this is a, a group that's going to have to work on a problem uh, for a couple of hours or all afternoon or something, you'll need somebody taking notes. You may lose track of where you actually are in the process. Now, again, with Dr. Williamson, I, I think that she's going to go over with you the problem-solving format, the stages that most groups go through when they're trying to reach a decision. You know, uh, it would have been interesting to uh, uh, observe the process in the jury with O.J.'s trial. You know, they found him innocent, but how did they reach that decision? What kind of, of information did they take into account? What kind of information? Uh, did they discard? 
because there was so much evidence on both sides of that. So you might want to reflect on that as because it's such a popular and, and long example when you think next class about the decision making process. How does a group decide which things they will take into account, which things they will not? Well, let's see what you take into account here. Uh, let me get four people and move you up front. You, I don't think you'll need any paper here. You, you can bring it if you want to. It makes you feel better. You're just going to need your imagination uh, for this. We're going to put you in four chairs up front here. And I'll get the instructions to go up on the screen very shortly. Yeah, come on up. Okay, you're on a boat that's sinking. Okay, I don't know if you've ever done this before. Uh, you're one of the survivors in the lifeboat. This is the USS Titanic, and it's going down. Okay, you're one of the six survivors in the lifeboat. Food and water are inadequate. Uh, since it's uncertain how many people will, will survive to shore, which we're assuming is an island, your task is to decide by what priorities people will remain in the lifeboat. Uh, since there are other survivors and other lifeboats out there bobbing around in the Gulf of Mexico, hurricanes approaching, or whatever. Uh, since there are other people out there in the lifeboats, your decision should reflect their interests as well as your own interests. Uh, however, you can't eat their food. Uh, if you're a priest, you can't perform miracles. You know, we've got to have some semblance of reality here. Uh, We'll take probably a maximum of 15 minutes for general discussion. We'll kind of see how this goes. And uh, when, when you're about discussed out, then we're going to start throwing people out of the lifeboat. Okay? And uh, a maximum of five minutes to throw you out of the boat. Now, I expect you to defend your own position. Okay. So put these up and let you think about who you want to be. I've got a doctor, a farmer, engineer, lawyer, theologian, and teacher. So, uh, oops, if I get on the screen. Okay, when you know who you want to be, uh, just tell me. <laughs> okay, they already threw the lawyer out. <laughs> hmm, you want to throw the theologian in? Okay. You're the, you're the teacher? You're the teacher. You're a doctor. Yeah, I'll let you choose. Okay, doctor. Yeah, pick one. Okay, we've got an engineer and a doctor. The farmer. What does that leave you with? You can pick whichever one you want. Lawyer. Okay, we're going to go back on the shot of the studio now. Uh, so those of you watching at home, okay, give me a wide shot here so these home viewers will know what we're dealing with. <laughs> About all they're going to get to the edge of your head there. Okay, this is the farmer, this is the lawyer, doctor, and engineer. Right, I've already forgotten what our choices were here. Okay, do you understand the assignment? Yeah, who are you going to throw out of the lifeboat first? But I expect you to have some rationale for doing that. There's six of you in the boat. Well, no, we, we'll just leave, we'll assume you toss the other two immediately. Yeah, I had six. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer and the theologian already put the dust. Hey, what, pull your microphones up there if you can reach them and just keep them. Uh, down, can you reach that one? Yeah. You mean I was already thrown out? No, the, the I'm sorry. Well, who did we throw out? I think we the teacher got it. Oh, the teacher. Okay, I'm gone. There we go. Okay, the theologian and the teacher are gone. Okay, so the doctor, the farmer, the engineer, and the lawyer are going to have at it here. Uh, maybe as much as 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to back off and let you do your thing. But, you, but go ahead and hold the microphone down. Just keep it down so that. Um, It'll pick up. First of all, I think the the people who sh who can't swim shouldn't be tossed overboard. That that would be cold weather. Since I'm a farmer, I probably don't know how to swim. <laughs> 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 I think the lawyers need to go because 
There are too many lawyers. We already have too many lawyers in the world. One will be missed. But how many lawyers are on the island? And who's going to? Who needs? Who needs? We need laws. We need laws. Who's going to? Who's going to develop the laws? Well, so, I can't go because if somebody gets sick, I'm the only one to care. So. And I can't go because I mean I'm the only one that's going to help us get out of here. She you know, might be I mean, able to build the boat. I could build the boat. I could build you know whatever. Build something on the island. So I can't die. Well, if you need a patent on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you'll have to. No, I can't help you. <laughs> I can't help you there. Well, he can't go because he's my attorney. <laughs> okay. Well, the farmer can't go because he needs food. And the farmer has to plant crops and grow food. We're going to be here for a long time. The farmer can't go. Well, who's going to protect the farmer if the engineer wants to develop something in his land? But every every society needs laws. How many everybody. people can stay on the boat? Only one. Only one. Yeah, you're all gonna go one oh. at a time. Oh, one at a time. Okay. So we so have to choose among us. We yeah, but I'm us. trying to get you to set the priorities. Oh, okay. Right. So we're gonna throw just one of us off the boat. No, three well, of one us of you right. goes first. Oh. oh. Eventually, all of us are gonna go, but right. I guess we have to kind of. No, one of you is gonna make it to shore. I say the lawyer goes first. The lawyer goes first. Heck, we can have a democracy. I mean, yeah. this is our Okay, but why does the lawyer go? Focus on the why. He, he can't really contribute anything to our survival as far as um, uh, food and, and building. Those are the and, basics uh, for survival. Food and shelter. Being able to take care of yourself. And tell each other. Being able to take care of yourself. Those are the tell basics. him. You're going to have to go into the shots here. Once you get to land, who's going to keep the peace among all three of you guys? Who's going to be able to, to decide? Not necessarily decide who's right and wrong, but who's going to, who's going to be able to decide who gets what, and you know, and what fair is. Well, that's what a leader. Well, is. Lawyers are are leaders, and you need leaders. But in order of importance, food, health, being able to take care of somebody who gets sick. Leadership will lead. Last leadership will lead you to food, health. I say we just get the boat moving. <laughs> because of all the, the, the education that I have. <laughs> <laughs> we already threw the teacher off. So it's Wait, I'm an engineer and you're a doctor. Oh, maybe we shouldn't have thrown the teacher off because we're going to be <laughs> a bunch of idiots on our <laughs> <laughs> Only your children. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still think the lawyer goes first. I still, yeah, I agree. I think the lawyer should go first because well, we should You guys be, are making a big mistake <laughs> once you get there. We should be a democracy and we should decide what's best for everybody and the lawyer is going to think about what it, Who knows more? what a democracy is in a lawyer. But the people decide the democracy. A lawyer doesn't decide the democracy for us. Nobody We're the upholds people. a democracy. I think you're reaching. <laughs> so we've got... Guilty right. until proven innocent. I, th I think <laughs> food is actually probably the lawyer. most important thing. Right. Not um, innocent until proven guilty. Not, I mean, it's not guilty until... There's right, but it, all of that really doesn't that. matter. No, but that's, that's democracy. <laughs> if you don't have food. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, so. Food, and I think food food is most important. Shelter is probably second. Um, I, I forgot what, what Doctor. You, doctor. Uh, that's pretty important. Lawyer, too. then engineer. Engineer is out. I don't really see the importance. Well, I see. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be me and then you. <laughs> <laughs> I would have gone for the doctor. <laughs> Why? What's Everybody needs doctors. If you get sick, then you just what? What medication do you have? With you? Well, in collaboration with the farm, the government tells me. I can grow herbs benefits. and stuff like that. We don't need a doctor. <laughs> no, that's not even logical. That's not logical. The doctor has to say. I agree the farm are most important is the doctor. Well, I think people have survived without doctors before. <laughs> people had. <laughs> And then, well, in the in the Middle Ages, they didn't have doctors. Of course, you had the Black Plague, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, people can learn how to farm. The cavemen <laughs> learned how to farm. That's true. And uh, they eventually developed into you know societies where laws were instituted, leaders. So naturally, I think that, you know, I think any of us here can learn how to farm. 
<laughs> okay, I see how it is. <laughs> no idea. The engineer, I, I agree that we're, we're probably going to need an engineer to get off the island. Nobody else is going to know how to get off. I mean, unless we're just going to end up and give up, give up our hope um, to stay at the island. I mean, that's it. Okay, depending how far the island is from the shore, once we get off the island, then what? There's still the struggle to get from, from the water to the shore, and then you can't help there. Well, and there's a voice engineer? from heaven or what something. What kind of engineer are you? Software yeah. engineer? Well, what kind of doctor is she? Yeah. What is she, you know, she's a gynecologist. We all <laughs> All the babies will be healthy. You know, we'll have good kids, but... With no yeah. food, if I... With no food. <laughs> well. So, it, so far, what is what is the uh, the order that we've ranked them in? Um, Farmer, doctor, engineer. I mean, if, <laughs> if, I, if I were to rank them, I would, I would say... Um, I'd probably say the same thing, farmer, doctor, engineer, boy. I'd agree. Yeah. I'd agree. No, I would. Yeah. I really would because, um, I mean, who's kidding who? We're living, I mean, I don't want to die either. Yeah, here, but anybody can learn how to farm. If you're going to, you know, you know stack in an order of importance, if not first, I think a lawyer would probably be second. Yeah, being a farmer is not all about planting. <laughs> Might be nice to have what well, to do with them after you cultivate them. Right. I mean, he's got to think of, I mean, if we're completely giving up and let's say the engineer is dead or we're kicking the engineer off the boat, then the farmer's got to keep, you know, not just the people, you know, alive, but if they have kids, because you're the doctor, God knows what you're going to do, how many babies right. we're going to have or whatever, so we've got a little uh, population going, so he has to continue on and help, you know, help us all years from now. Mm -hmm. So I think the farmer would be the most important. Right. So now we're ranking it from farmer being number one for engineer, doctor. Engineer, doctor, doctor, engineer. Okay. And then lawyer. That's definitely All right, that. who goes first? Who's going to sue the doctor? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who goes who goes Who's going to sue the farmer? What <laughs> <laughs> Nothing yet. <laughs> I'm going to hoard the food. Well, can we all agree that lawyer is law, our first? Laws are essential in society. I agree, but people can develop their own laws exactly. without a lawyer. Just in the same way that people would, you know, farm. Okay, one minute and you have to belt somebody. Okay. Just take a vote. Okay. <laughs> There's our democracy. <laughs> But are you strong enough to push him over the side? <laughs> oh, there's three of us and one of right. <laughs> Okay, so the lawyer, <laughs> la lawyer's gone. Okay, you can't talk anymore for a month. Okay, three people left here. <laughs> no, I'm the engineer because I'm there to take care of everybody. I'm sure I'm going to get sick and die, and then we all die. So you're next. I agree. She jumps. Okay, so the engineer <laughs> jumped over. Okay, we got a doctor and a lawyer left. <laughs> doctor and farmer. farmer. I'm sorry, farmer. I've got it written down. Doctor and farmer. I'll say me, because farmer is most important. Okay. Yeah. Y'all are so self sacrificing <laughs> and noble <laughs> when there's no water sloshing up on the <laughs> sides of the boat here. I fought going out. <laughs> That's right. That was a noble boat. And now okay. I feel guilty. And you feel guilty? <laughs> okay, stay put for a minute, for several minutes. And think about the process. Uh, is th what kinds of information was not acquired? Uh, we've got one viewer in the back. Can you think? You raised the question, Ginger, of what kind of engineer, what kind of doctor. Is there any other information that might have been useful? It only takes two people to have politics. And even on the Mayflower, they, they made up some form. They signed the Mayflower Compact Pact before they landed. It seems like they really cut the lawyer off at the pass. Not that I think that he necessarily had more right to live than any of the rest of them, just that there are some other arguments for the attorney that didn't come up. Okay. If they could have used his services before they pushed him <laughs> over. <laughs> okay. Um, 
one thing I thought about is that would have given less credence to the farmer would be if you assume this is a tropical island. You know, now I don't know if you know, we didn't say whether you're off the coast of Nova Scotia or if you're out in the Bahamas. Uh, but there's a fair chance that there's coconuts and pineapple and whatever, macadamia nuts. Uh, <laughs> no, just trying to, you know, because when you get caught up in it, you know, when, when you're involved in the process directly, you get tunnel vision, and that's okay. That's how this is supposed to work. And I'll to help you see. And, and you're such a nice, easygoing group here that you were very kind about taking each other's points of view and being noble. Uh, I've had some groups get into this and really get vicious. You know, no, you know, I have to live because, and so forth. Okay, we're going to do this one more time and, and give you some different roles. Uh, got the same boat going down again, uh, and uh, we'll assume a tropical island because we don't have a farmer on board this time. Uh, this time we have a nutritionist, oh, and you can choose and then we'll trash the other two. A nutritionist, a world leader, a doctor, a theologian, a scientist, and a professor. But let's see, based on the evaluation of, of what we went through this time, uh, if any of your thought processes change going through this again. Okay, here's our, our lawyer turned into a world leader. Okay, this is a professor up here. Okay, a nutritionist and a scientist. Okay, go for it. We obviously need to keep the world leader on board because uh, people will be looking for him, and he might be recognized if there's, you know, maybe there's people on the island, maybe not. But you got all these people out here but, in the other lifeboats. You know, you may have several other hundred, several hundred other people out here. We don't know how many are going to make it. Uh, you know, not to go back to the lawyer argument, but. Who's going to keep the order? What if I wasn't from your country and I don't like what you have to say and you know you don't have a democracy? Let's say you don't like minorities or you don't like women or you know you have a very set standard. Whatever those laws are in that country doesn't mean they apply to my country. If you're from Russia or if I'm from the United States, I mean, could what country? Stalin. Yeah, you could be <laughs> Hitler. I don't. I don't want to have anything to do with Hitler. People are going to be looking for you. <laughs> but saying, saying he was, Why? I say you look better in a book in a textbook. <laughs> say, say it was somebody like uh, uh, know, George Bush or, or something like that. And, and not, sorry, Bill Clinton. Think of it yeah. this way. Regardless of whether you like my point of view or not, if you were to be the people that saved me, the rewards could be beyond your imagination. <laughs> yeah, but okay. you don't have material wealth if you're out in the middle of the island. What do you have a credit no, card? I mean, no, how are you benefiting? If us? the people that are looking for me find me, actually, that's true. Reward, if he's on, if he's, a, if, if he's gone down in a boat, um, people uh, say he was George Bush, and we're on the Titanic and it sunk, and there's a possibility that he's still alive. People are going to be looking for him. They're not going to just say, "Well, you know, he went down so long." But you're so, the professor, right? Right. Now, what do you teach? Um, because you teach... Survival. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sort of a generic professor. Wow. Like the one on uh, Gilligan's Island. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Didn't he get everybody off? Did he? I don't know. I'd have to agree with that, the world leader. I think he should, he should probably stay. If, if, if we were considering being rescued. Uh. Mm. Well, I can see why I have to say, because all that tropical food there, you eat the wrong thing, you eat too much of it, you could die and get sick and poison us. And everybody was poisoned, everybody died. So I have to be there, too. Well, I have to be a scientist, because obviously I have to stay alive. Um, if y'all eat something, I could describe it to you. So it kind of fits into the nutritionist. Wait, what kind of science? You know? <laughs> 
I mean, are you like I know that saves you. <laughs> saves you. I mean, if you eat something bad, I could, or if you, um, there's chemicals in your body, kind of like a doctor, I'd let you know what your symptoms are. So I'm going to know about medicine. I'm going to know about food. I'm going to know about good reactions and bad reactions and what I could predict. How many of you guys want to be rich? That's the question. If I make it, if I survive, and you guys are, are, are the people that help me survive, and these other people, you're probably going to get some sort of reward. And if we don't like make it to the wild, <laughs> then we're dead, and you're back. That doesn't benefit us at all. Nobody says you're going to die if you're off the boat. Mm -hmm. So who goes first? Somebody else might like pick you. I, I say the nutritionist is off the boat. No, I say the professor's the, the, there's, off the there's boat. He doesn't teach anything. Tropical fruit that sure. we the get. scientist there's tropical doesn't. tropical fruit that we know. He's, he's a professor of survival. <laughs> <laughs> If he knows survival, he obviously. As a matter of fact, this is where my dissertation was. <laughs> surviving on a tropical island. <laughs> hey, wait oh a my. <laughs> Makes less of a case for me now. How about aquatics? <laughs> I mean, the professor. I mean, it depends. I mean, if if they've taught obviously and they're in school, they know how to interact with people. Um, and if we have children on the island, or if we're going to have other children, what, I keep thinking. What exactly are your qualifications as a scientist? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you what are your qualifications? <laughs> you know, but as as a teacher, you could you could still have priority um, to just teach teach us about things about knowledge. I mean, we have to have something to do. We have no television. We have no magazines. We have no life, guys. I, mean, I, I agree. He could, I, it, <laughs> he could tell it, us about things we don't it, we, we don't know. We're planning to be there a long time. Uh, I think uh, somebody to educate people is mm -hmm. definitely. As a world leader and being used to making these kinds of decisions, I think in, in order of ranking, <laughs> I would put myself first, probably the professor second, scientist third, and the nutritionist. If you fourth. have, we have children and we procreate. That's How what are we supposed to know our children can eat? That's what the scientists is for. Well, is that a general scientist that knows everything? <laughs> I mean, well, we had, I mean, women had babies in the crops before we had doctors and nutritionists. I mean, if we eat too much, we're going to get fat. If we don't eat enough, we're going to die. So, I mean. There's probably another boat. Coming. I think we can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> are you a good swimmer? <laughs> Democratic country, I say we uh, take a vote, and uh, after the vote, I'll decide whether it's good or not. Oh, you'll <laughs> okay. We have a benevolent dictator. <laughs> Who says the nutritionist goes? I. I'm gonna go ahead and say, see ya. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. No. <laughs> we still, as a world leader. <laughs> <laughs> I'm faced with making a, a, another important decision, and I decide the uh, scientist goes. And what's your reasoning? He's a. Uh, I actually. Uh, you have my an illness. Is in, in uh, science. Oh really? Is it really? <laughs> we'll have a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, <laughs> so, okay, if you get something on the island, some kind of disease, let's, let's, and it's tropical, and we've never been there, you have no knowledge of what's on the island. You don't know what to eat. Um, you eat something that's not good for you, chemical makeup, your body is not used to the environment, chemicals in the air. Who's you looking for you? Are, do you want to die? <laughs> it's that my simple. Do you want to die? I'm going to make it to the island. Somebody's <coughs> going to find me. Okay. So if you, if you develop yellow fever or, or some, some, I'm not going to even say what's coming to my mind, but some kind of disease, I mean, you, you want to know, know how to cure that, it that, or mean, develop some kind of drug. I'm going to take some plants or get something going instead of sitting there going, well, she's a scientist, I guess she's not qualified. I mean, I, I am qualified. <laughs> I, I think one point we <coughs> forgot to make is, is people are going to be looking for him whether he's dead or alive. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a very good point. Because <laughs> so, uh, if we kill you, nobody's going to know. <laughs> <laughs> if we push him off right now, nobody will ever know. <laughs> I have to say this, as, <laughs> as, <laughs> as, <laughs> in ranking some of the most important decisions in my illustrious career, this probably is the most important, and I have to say that the uh, professor for that <laughs> remark should be the next person off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, I, the, the scientist uh, persuaded me enough to see that maybe I was that there's an error in my thinking. That this, uh, this is just a political uh, <laughs> <laughs> maneuver here <laughs> to save his own butt. <laughs> <laughs> he wants good press. Right. Sixty seconds. As, as a professor at. <laughs> With, uh, with a background in the liberal art of survival, I'd, I'd have to uh, question uh, your authority. And question I, my authority and survive on your own. <laughs> I say you're out the boat. Let's take a vote. All in favor of the professor being getting thrown off the boat. I think, I think I, the world leader should go because uh, they are going to look for him whether he's you know, alive or dead. But you can survive. Um, I need to stay on the boat. Well, right now, you're. I mean, you know, as a world leader, we don't know what the other people think about you and what's good for the people. And so I think I'm back to the same consensus. I mean, with you, you could at least pro provide knowledge for us right now, give us some hope, let us know what's going on um, in your in your mind, what you've studied and for our, our children. So I don't feel the wor world leader is as important as the professor. You have nothing to tell us besides, <laughs> <laughs> besides, besides what you want and your needs. He's going to teach us about our hope and our future. He forgot to tell you he used to be a professor. <laughs> <laughs> of survival. So I vote for world leader to go next. Yeah, I, I go ahead and say world leader. You guys are making a so big mistake. <laughs> world leader. My friends are powerful. Blob. <laughs> Blob. Blob. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Scientist and the professor. She'd actually probably have a better chance of surviving uh, if she's a scientist and, and I say I, I was a professor of say, literature or something like that. Um, I mean, all, I, all I'm getting is reading a book, I guess. So, so I'll go ahead and get off the bus. Oh, you're going to sacrifice <laughs> now, okay, after the other two are gone. <laughs> okay, good. Congratulations. You survived. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Just Stay put. We've only got a few minutes left. Okay, that was very creative. For the benefit of the home viewers and the channel surfers who've tuned in, these two guys are brothers. <laughs> so turn around that face, the camera, let them. So, yeah, wait to read He should have been in cahoots with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you kind of were for a while instinctively, but then you turned on him. <laughs> and so, if they're on the news later, <laughs> Having done one another end, it all started here. Like Bronco. <laughs> Can't touch that one. Okay, uh, let's quickly go through uh, some things. That if if you were in a big problem-solving situation, if you want to go back to take notes, you can. <clears throat> uh, if this were a lengthy problem-solving discussion of a real nature, uh, you would see these roles evolve even more. But just for fun, you can kind of mentally check off in your head um, in our role playing what kinds of things uh, were taking place. Just a little bit. Okay, one expresses support and releases tension. We had a lot of that in this one, it was a fun discussion, but you heard a lot of laughter, a lot of easy going. Uh, and if that were happening in real groups too, if we were having this much fun in a serious group, we might not ever get the task accomplished, but we might because they eventually got the people uh, out of the boat and so forth here. But, you know, monitor within the group. Who are the people that help keep your group happy, who make things uh, easy going? On the flip side of that, are there people, hopefully not, but are there people in the group that express antagonism uh, and or tension? Some people get really uptight when there's a decision to be made and they may get nasty and antagonistic. And occasionally, even in this fun role playing, I've seen people get into situations uh, where they got pretty nasty and abrasive with one another. And so, you know, better not to. Uh, number three, agree. who in the group agrees or accepts conclusions? Now, some people are very agreeable and um, uh, go along with decisions by other people. Other folks are uh, hard to please and, and much less easily satisfied. Let me get a mark on here. I think that will help. Okay. 
okay? Who gives information? Okay, and in some instances here, because you didn't have real information to start with, uh, we had uh, people asking questions, and we'll see that on down here. Well, this is way down there, asking for clarification. No. But you have people asking for information. How much money do we have in the budget? Uh, how long would it take to implement something? What kind of a professor are you? What kind of a scientist are you? Sometimes you need additional information. Uh, sometimes the person who is asked can provide that information. Other times it um, needs to come from someone else in the group. Okay, who gives arguments or reasons? And you all got better at reasoning in the second discussion than you did in the first one. This one that takes a while to get with the flow of something like this. But could, could you feel more reasoning emerging the second time? Okay, and particularly with the world leader. You started with some good reasons, but then it, it took them a few minutes, but they came up with some that eventually did you in. And that's how group process works, which is why we try to avoid jumping to hasty decisions when they're important decisions, because it sometimes takes a while to think through all the dimensions of that. Okay, gives opinions, gives ideas, uh, defines and clarifies, who offers procedural help, who asks for procedural help, who asks for clarification or opinions or information and who provides those answers, okay? And these come out of the work of a, a researcher named Bales, and you'll probably uh, hear Bales' name uh, come up in the next class as well, because these are frequently categories that are used in uh, evaluating groups, and you could actually uh, fill out a participation form if we were having a 30-minute discussion on what to do about pollution in Houston, or if we were an, an executive board, uh, taking an hour to discuss where our next convention site should be. You could take a, a profile form like that and go along making check marks and counting, you know, this with the names of the people. This person has lots of information. This person asks lots of good questions. This person usually has a a hostile negative remark, or you may find that everybody is doing those things and that the participation is reasonably balanced in those. But as you uh, get on into group process next time, you know, this is just kind of a preview of some things that are coming uh, in the next class. Okay, I brought a, kind of shift gears here in our last little bit, I brought an article along, I don't know if you saw this or not, in the Wednesday, September 27th Houston Chronicle. But the, the headline involves the GOP convention, and it says, uh, conventional convention, the GOP to stick with the four-day format for 1996. Does anybody know why? No. Okay, they're taking into account the Olympics. Okay, the Olympics are bumping in, potentially, we're bumping into uh, the GOP dates. And we talked when we had our professional meeting planners here we talked about uh, all the different kinds of things that you have to take into account from whether there's a home builders convention in town uh, to whether hurricanes are likely to be coming ashore and so forth. And so this, particularly this is real short, but Republicans have mixed proposals to string out the party's nominating convention next year. And the quadrennial session will use the traditional Monday through Thursday format and the party announced this on Tuesday. The meeting at which the GOP presidential candidate will be formally selected will be held August 12 through 15 in San Diego. Arrangements Chairman Michael W. Greeby, I don't know how to pronounce his name. The dates are later than usual for the party out of the White House because Republicans did not want to meet until after the Olympic Games were complete. Four-day format has been traditional for Democrats and Republicans for many years, including the GOP's 1992 convention in Houston. So even though they're in different parts of the country, 
the Olympics will draw so many people that uh, they've taken that into account as part of their convention planning uh, for the Republican convention. Okay, we probably don't have time to get into them today, but I've had two interesting phone calls, and I'll pose at least uh, one of these, uh, some phone calls from uh, people with parliamentary problems, and shortly we'll be going into those problems. But I had uh, a national president phone late at night recently, uh, pretty frustrated with her national convention only a few weeks away. The secretary had failed to prepare the minutes from the board meeting of the last convention. So here they were almost a year later with no minutes. And the question was, what should she do? And then another thing that had occurred was that, and I'd never heard of this one before, so I had to think a little. She had a standing committee that unilaterally scheduled an additional convention speaker. They decided it would be really neat to have this person come in. And so she wanted to know, you know, is this allowable? Does a committee have the authority to do that? Any reactions to either one of these off the top of your head? Okay. I'll probably have to read more into Robert's Rules of Order. Ah, okay. <laughs> and you're saved by a flashing light in the back, which means we're running out of time. But think about this. And uh, think about what information you would need to know, and we'll pick up with this. When, I won't be here next class, but when I come back, we'll start with this parliamentary issue. Uh, can a committee do things on its own, such as this? And what do you do when the convention minutes have not been prepared? And we'll answer those, but this will give you a week or so to think through it and read about it. <laughs>